Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our Period in Review Business Forum group presentation. Um, for those that have joined me previously, welcome back. Um, for those that are new to these sessions, I would like to welcome you into the forum. Um, for those that are new, again, these forums are somewhat a little bit different in that um, it's not a classic presentation or webinar structure, but rather it's presented in a way which is meant to provide the first 20 minutes or so, a general update in the current lay of the land, um, not COVID restricted, not job keeper restricted, but matters generally in this period of time. And then the predominant focus, um, hopefully around 40 minutes of that presentation, of the time today, will be allocated to your questions. Yeah? It's an opportunity for you to tap into myself and other colleagues within SCB Group to address any particular question, concern, um, um, inquiry that you may have. Again, not specifically related to COVID, not specifically related to JobKeeper, but any matter generally so that we can support you and your business through these difficult times. Having said that, um, unfortunately, the vast bulk of today's session um, will be on matters arising from or relating to JobKeeper and the current um, pandemic. Um, I, I think it's probably fair to say that um, the, the current circumstances have developed rather rapidly um, over the last month. And with that, we've seen a couple of pretty interesting announcements in the context of JobKeeper, um, which a lot of people are very interested in given that I think that it will have broad and somewhat far-reaching implications for many businesses. And I, I suspect that those implications may not necessarily be understood or appreciated by many at this point in time. So we'll go through all of that. And I appreciate that a lot of you will have different questions unique to your own business circumstances. So please don't hesitate to raise them. Um, we do have a Q&A function at the top of your screen, so please feel free to raise any questions as we go through the presentation or discussion today. Um, where I can, and you must appreciate we get a lot of questions, but where I can, if I see a question um, coming up through the presentation I, and it's relevant, I may try to address it at that point in time. Alternatively, um, what we'll do is one of my colleagues assists with the collation of those questions, grouping them, and then we'll send through questions of a similar topic so that we get through as many of those as we can. Of course, we can't sometimes get through all of the questions, in which case we'll try to group them so that we're getting through as many topic areas as possible. And then of course, if you need any further individual assistance, either myself or my colleagues are happy to support. Um, I think the big news in relation to the COVID pandemic is the increasing experience in Victoria, um, which is seemingly worsening um, over time despite the restrictions and lockdown having now been in place for well over a two week period. Um, I did provide these figures um, last fortnight, but I've updated them. But it, it, it's really alarming to see the growth in numbers reported in Victoria over a relatively short period of time. And today we've seen the announcement of 723 new cases in Victoria in the last 24 hours, um, despite anticipation on Monday that Monday would have been the peak and modelling by the government suggested that numbers in future would decrease from there on. So it does show that there is a significant experience in Victoria. Pleasingly, other states have avoided that similar experience. But my comments in the, in the next couple of slides, I guess, will be limited to those businesses which currently operate in Victoria. Um, as a result of the increased um, re incidences in both Victoria and constant um, or, or steady numbers reported in, in New South Wales, um, there have been further border restrictions announced um, between New South Wales and Queensland um, and a tightening of border restrictions in, in Vic, between Victoria and New South Wales, um, and which is already in place. 
We've also seen that from Saturday the 1st of August, all gyms will now have to have a COVID safety marshal on premises at all times, including those operations which operate under an unsupervised 24-hour model. So that's pretty significant for some of those fitness establishments which operate a model of not being staffed but rather members can access premises on a 24-7 basis. In those, in those particular associate organisations rather, there's no exception or exemption rather for, for those particular models, meaning that those establishments will need to limit their operations to those hours which are staffed or alternatively will have to staff it on a 24-7 basis which obviously most establishments would say is not economic or justifiable in the circumstances. So we are seeing that there is additional and tightening of restrictions in most locations, particularly Victoria and New South Wales um, as a result. So businesses will really need to stay ahead of those announcements and ensure that they're implemented. We are also seeing that in both states, and we've seen this a lot and reported from our clients directly, that there is a greater level of enforcement activities in those particular locations, ensuring that effectively businesses um, are complying with the revised restrictions. So I did discuss this last week, and I'll briefly go through it again this week, just because um, um, since the last session two weeks ago, I, I have received a lot of calls in relation to this again, um, questioning what the implications of the increased um, 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 infection rates in Victoria mean. <clears throat> so I, I think we break it down into a couple of areas. One I would loosely call business continuity, the second called JobKeeper. Um, Obviously, I think that there's an immediate need for any business which operates in Victoria to undertake this process. However, those that don't currently operate in Victoria, um, I, I'm hearing and experiencing with my own clients that people are certainly going through this process anyway because they're almost experiencing what I would call a second wave of employee concern where employees are now you know, expressing a view around remaining at home, wanting to extend working from home arrangements, etc., despite um, other states having a relatively stable or low um, infection rate. So that being said, a couple of tips. From a business continuity perspective, consider what operations can operate within the existence of your exist of current restrictions. Assess whether it's reasonably practicable for employees to work from home and to put arrangements in place to, to accommodate that. I think this is an important one um, and people often overlook it because um, the framework um, in March was a relatively quick structure where businesses allowed um, employees to just quickly work from home. But I think we've now got an opportunity to consider that further and in a more comprehensive and appropriate fashion. Yeah. So what are the safety issues at home? Are we going through a working from home checklist? Are we considering um, WHS issues from home? Um, are we formalising those arrangements? Are we formalising <coughs> excuse me, how an employee works from home, what the hours of work are, if they have childcare responsibilities from home, etc. Um, and we're creating a formalised structure around that. Um, of course, consider um, a redeployment of work location, a task to other locations and consider your suppliers, agents, contractors, etc., to ensure continuity. Um, I know in health, as an example, we're starting to see and have reported that there is a significant restriction around the access to PPE, as an example. So <clears throat> businesses may need to consider those type of aspects. From a JobKeeper perspective, and I'll talk a lot about this later, <clears throat> There is the need to identify those JobKeeper eligible employees, to consult with employees if there's any variation to the, an existing JobKeeper enabled direction, to provide at least three days written notice of any variation to a JobKeeper enabled direction, and to consider alternative options for ineligible employees. 
Now, this is the last one, uh, the last bullet point that I just want to spend a bit of time on, because the others we'll discuss later. Um, we need to consider that there will be a cohort or a number of employers which were either not eligible for JobKeeper in the first place or chose not to apply. Um, there's also a number of employees within any business um, that are ineligible employees of their own right. That may be that they started work after the 1st of March 2020, <clears throat> they're not considered a long-term casual, etc. So we really do need to identify you know, A, am I a JobKeeper enabled business? And B, in my business, are there any employees which are ineligible and outside that structure? Because effectively those employees cannot be flexed up and down through a JobKeeper enabled direction and we need to deal with them separately. And we deal with them separately by way of either a mutual agreement to vary their role, um, reduction in hours on a temporary basis, um, um, period of unpaid leave as an example, or potentially redundancy. It's really key that we identify those groups so that we can undertake effective planning. On the 21st of July, uh, and you know, we, we've been discussing um, um, these changes for some time, and I've given my tips around what I thought would occur, which has broadly come through. But on the 21st of July, the government announced an extension to the JobKeeper scheme until effectively March of next year. And this is a really welcome announcement by many in the press and economists at large. Um, and it's said to have avoided the fiscal cliff in September, the 28th of September, when JobKeeper 1.0 would end, but has rather created a fiscal slide, as they're now calling it, in that JobKeeper 2.0 is effectively supporting businesses that need ongoing support whilst also recognising that it will not artificially inflate the salary or entitlements of particular employees under that scheme. So it's a really interesting, I think, excellent and clever um, initiative which is going to cost around an extra 16 billion from memory. But it's effectively said that the economy needs ongoing support, but that ongoing support will be much more targeted. Now that's the one thing that I think we need to appreciate is the targeting application of the extension. A lot in the media has focused on the extension of the JobKeeper scheme, but has not necessarily um, articulated and promoted the eligibility criteria which is now alongside that extension. So some businesses that I've been talking to have in a, uh, incorrectly rather assumed that they continue to be eligible for JobKeeper up until the end of March, when in fact an assessment of their business um, will generally mean that they will not be applicable and eligible for JobKeeper after the 28th of September. So I'll go through that in a sec. So generally what the announcement has said is that first of all, there is an application and eligibility gatekeeper test. And that is that businesses must continue to be impacted by COVID to be eligible for JobKeeper on an ongoing basis. And we know that certain businesses and industry groups are no longer adversely impacted by COVID or impacted to the extent of March and April. So for those businesses which are no longer impacted or impacted to a minimal extent, they will come out of JobKeeper. I'll explain the eligibility test in a moment. The government has then effectively created two categories of entitlement from an employee perspective. They've said that for full-time employees or for those which are working 20 hours or more per fortnight, the eligibility or the JobKeeper rate will decrease from $1,500 down to $1,200 in the first quarter. So that is 28th of September to the 3rd of January. In the second extended quarter, which is the 
January to March period next year, that reduces even further down to the first, uh, sorry, $1,100. For those employees which work less than 20 hours per fortnight, the rates are reduced to $750 and $650 respectively as seen on the screen. Now this particular issue is addressing people's ongoing criticisms of eligibility fairness, that it's not fair that I have a casual that is only typically earning $100 a week, but now they're getting $1,500 a fortnight, and that individual is now refusing to work, et cetera, et cetera. So what this employee eligibility category says is that those employees that would typically work less will not be benefited by the scheme. So remember um, previously the objectives of the scheme was um, an employment retention and a stimulus. This is now focusing more on employment protection as opposed to the stimulus. So uh, the question is how do we determine whether someone works less than 40 hours or more than 40 hours. The test is that you need to take an average of the four weekly periods before the 1st of March 2020. So that is the four weeks prior to the 1st of March 2020 will be taken as the assessment period and any part-time or casual employee must be assessed in that period to determine their average weekly, hour, sorry, average hours work per fortnight. We then consider whether they fall into the full-time rate or the reduced rate accordingly. If there is any <clears throat> concerns that that four-week period is not a true or reflective period, so someone may have been absent due to parental leave or carer's responsibility or annual leave or study leave, etc. There is the ability for the Commissioner of Taxation to take into account a differing period and that is upon request and application. So I would strongly suggest that businesses should be considering their eligibility first based on reduced turnover, and we'll discuss that in a moment, and then also looking at all of their existing employees and undertaking that calculation for the four pay periods prior to the 1st of March to determine whether they fall into the full rate category or the lesser rate category. Um, so we talk now about the first gatekeeper process, the employer eligibility test. Um, and generally speaking, the six month extension to JobKeeper from the end of September to the end of March next year is broken into two quarters. Yeah? First quarter, second quarter. To be eligible to continue participating in the JobKeeper scheme in the first extended quarter, businesses need to satisfy an actual reduction in turnover test for both the June and September quarters. So that is the June quarter is the months of April, May and June. The September quarter is July, August, September. So most obviously all businesses will now know whether they had an actual reduction of 30% or 50%, depending upon the size of your company, in the June quarter, because we're now at the end of July. Um, so that's easy to determine. We'll then need to assess what the actual turnover in set the September quarter is and satisfy the ATO of that in order to gain eligibility in the first extended quarter of JobKeeper. When we say that there needs to be an evidenced actual reduction in turnover, that is against the comparable period in 2019. 
That is, we're comparing the June quarter in 2020 against the June quarter in 2019. And we need to evidence that there's been an actual reduction in um, turnover between those two corresponding periods. Now, the June quarter is easy, and the government and the ATO will focus upon your BAS statements. The September quarter isn't necessarily as easy because the assessment will need to be undertaken by the ATO before the end of that quarter because the second or first extended quarter of JobKeeper starts on the 28th of September, which is before the BAS, statement, BAS period. And in any event, the BAS statement is not due until the end of October. So the ATO will put a process in place to ensure that you are able to make that assessment and inform the ATO. Um, as has always been the case, if for whatever reason you believe that the June and September quarters are not in 2019 are not comparable quarters upon which to undertake the assessment, that is, the turnover in those quarters in 2019 are artificially low and therefore not a fair um, 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 basis upon which to undertake the assessment. Then again, the Commissioner of um, Taxation in the ATO has the ability to put in place um, an alternative assessment. And there's two broad assessment tests which they've been proposed but not yet finalised. So you may wish to consider the June and September quarters in 2019. Is that not accurate because either you sold or acquired um, a part of your business? Um, impacted by annual leave, impacted by um, your own um, parental leave if you're a sole trader, um, impacted by natural disaster, bushfire, floods, etc. Um, all of those type of reasons are legitimate reasons which the ATO has listed as being factors which they would take into consideration. So to be eligible, again, for the first extended quarter of JobKeeper, we need to satisfy both the June and September quarters. In the end of December, start of January 2021, you, to be eligible for the second um, extended quarter of JobKeeper, you will need to also satisfy that there has been an actual reduction in turnover in the December quarter of, again, at least 30 or 50 percent, depending upon the size of your business. So. Just remember, um, we do need to undertake that assessment. <clears throat> we should be um, seeking advice from your accountant as to um, options available to you in um, recognising turnover in the September quarter to ensure eligibility for the first extended phase of JobKeeper. And we should also be making that assessment of our employees to determine whether they are in or out of that full-time slash part-time category. Um, Recognising the time, I'll quickly step through a couple of other important developments in the last week, week and a half. Um, given the current issue in Victoria impacting the aged care workers and aged care industry generally in that state, on the 22nd of July, the full bench of the Fair Work Commission um, took it upon themselves to um, 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 re-enliven a, a matter which was previously um, litigated before the Commission. And they indicated that um, it would be appropriate <clears throat> to extend paid pandemic leave into the aged care sector. So what the Fair Work Commission did was effectively say, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, um, persons working in Victoria in the aged care sector are now eligible to receive two weeks paid pandemic leave on each occasion. And it's not relevant um, whether they are casual, full-time or part-time. Um, it's also not relevant whether they contracted COVID um, in the workplace or whether they are required to self-isolate due to matters in connection with their employment. Um, it's just simply sufficient that if they're required to self-isolate, they have an entitlement 
to, to two weeks paid pandemic leave. Um, the Prime Minister also came out yesterday saying that effectively um, he hasn't ruled out um, extending that entitlement to other employers across the country and in other industries and has acknowledged that he has spoken to the Minister about that and the Minister has indicated that he has himself started consulting with union bodies and employer groups around what that may look like. Um, through that consideration, considered process rather, the ACTU raised quite rightfully that there are a number of people employed in the aged care sector which are not employed under the aged care award and in particular the nurses award and health professionals award was mentioned. Um, and, and as such the, the, the Fair Work Commission has now extended paid pandemic leave provisions into those three awards that is the Aged Care Award, Nurses Award and Health Professional and Support Services Award where an employee is employed in the aged care industry in Victoria. Okay, So needs to be employed in the aged care industry in Victoria. So by extension, um, you know, a physio employed under a Health Professionals and Support Services Award not in the aged care industry would not be entitled to paid pandemic leave. Um, <clears throat> so the um, paid pandemic leave is available to employees where they are either required to self-isolate um, by government regulation or medical authorities, um, or they are required to self-isolate um, by their employer. They are required um, to self-isolate or quarantine on the advice of a medical practitioner. Um, they are required to self-isolate while waiting the tests of a COVID test or due to any other measures taken by the government or medical authorities. <clears throat> As I said before, it's rather interesting that there is not a requirement that the COVID test or isolation or infection it arises from or is in connection with the workplace. There is no service qualification, so an employee does not have to be with you for a year or six months before they're eligible. And there is no precondition upon being either full-time, part-time, casual. All employees, regardless of status, regardless of tenure, will be entitled to this paid pandemic leave in the event that they meet one of those criteria on the screen. So, so naturally, um, that may obviously create some complexity, um, and that may create some complexity not only from a cost perspective, but also from a business continuity perspective. Um, so as an example, um, you know, if, if one of your staff are infected by COVID and everyone needs to self-isolate um, um, because of that, we need to think about A, that cost implication, but B, that means that your employees are self-isolating and there may not necessarily be individuals to ensure the continuity of the business structure. So last slide before we go to questions. Um, um, Naturally, a lot of people then raise the question of, well, what do I pay people during that two-week period of paid pandemic leave? Um, and, and that is that effectively um, the full-time employee is paid at their normal base rate of pay. Um, the part-time employees will be paid at their um, ordinary hours of work or their average over the previous six weeks, whichever is greater. Yeah. Um, and then we have casual employees, which are um, also the average over the previous six weeks, or alternatively, um, um, where they haven't been employed for six weeks at least, um, that that would be um, um, taken as their um, um, entire duration of employment. Yeah. Um, should say and just confirm that obviously a casual employee, there is a precondition that they're employed um, on a regular and systematic basis. 
So that obviously means that effectively um, they need to um, 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 be engaged with you on that on a regular basis um, for, in order to be eligible for, for this particular entitlement. So a, a lot going on in, in the last um, two week period. Um, so happy to take your questions and some have um, already started coming through. So please if you've got any further questions um, please send them through using the Q&A function and we'll certainly try to address as many as we can. Um, first question is in relation, relation to um, JobKeeper. The question is, is there any scope under the new eligibility criteria for businesses to add a new employee to the scheme if they weren't employed before the 1st of March? Um, and I think the question that says, I've had turnover in my team of employees that were um, um, previously eligible and now I receive no subsidy for them. Um, unfortunately not. Um, um, as, as I understand it, reading the guidance material which I have, there's no alteration to an employee's particular eligibility requirement. So again, it's just um, that straight test of needing to be employed on the 1st of March 2020 or be considered a regular and systematic casual employee on that date. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that businesses have taken on new employees since that period of time, um, but effectively that hasn't been altered and those new employees would effectively be excluded from the operation of the scheme. Um, another question on JobKeeper, if, you have, if your employee is a new staff member while you are already receiving JobKeeper, will you receive JobKeeper for them as well? I think that's the same type of question. No, if they are a new employee following um, the first or after the 1st of March 2020, they are no, not eligible um, um, simply because the JobKeeper scheme has been extended. Next question um, relates to, I assume, um, JobKeeper and casual employees. Um, if a casual employee's hours vary from week to week, maybe eight hours, maybe 35, how can we classify over or under the 20 hours? Yeah, um, I, I think I may have, um, that question may have come through prior to me um, addressing that on the, the, the slide, but effectively what we need to do is to undertake the assessment for the four weeks prior to the 1st of March 2020 and then consider what their average fortnightly hours were worked over that period. So exactly that, <clears throat> as an example, someone working eight hours on one fortnight, a uh, one week and then 35 hours uh, on another, um, let's say that that's over um, you know, four weeks, so eight hours in one fortnight, 35 in the next, you then divide that out and it means that effectively their average um, fortnightly hours of work will be 21 and a half hours. So yeah, you need to go through and undertake that assessment. Um, as I said, you should be starting to do that in advance. Don't leave it too late. Um, um, you need to start giving that appropriate consideration. And you need to start considering that um, um, from the perspective of A, whether you don't have um, enough data in that four week period for that to be a comparable period and therefore you need to make an, an application for exemption or alternative consideration by the ATO and you need to prepare that well in advance before the JobKeeper scheme 2.0 starts. Um, and secondly from a cash flow perspective, um, um, I've been talking to a lot through presentations around the importance of cash flow um, um, and I'm by no means an accountant or a professional um, financial advisor, but um, all financial advisors have been strongly advocating a very tight cash flow projection um, when, when this pandemic first hit in March. Um, and, and cash flow projections were, were one of the most important aspects promoted by financial planners. It's the same now. If you've modelled um, your cash flow projections on the basis of JobKeeper 1.0 not being extended, um, or have been extended, anticipated, you need to re revisit those models. And you're needing to make sure that you've got sufficient cash to get you through the next period. 
particularly, I think that the last quarter of this year and the first quarter of next may be challenging for many businesses. Um, so we just need to consider that. You know, obviously we've got the Christmas period. Uh, it's probably unlikely that people will be travelling. Expenditure might be less than anticipated. So we just need to consider that. So. You know, average over the four weeks before the 1st of March is the specific answer to the question. Start planning and identifying that sooner rather than later. You obviously already have the data to undertake that assessment now. Consider any specific examples where you need to go to the ATO and request an alteration or an exemption and also um, speak with your accountant internal bookkeeper etc and start your process of modelling cash flow. Also, just remember, sorry, um, um, similar with that, is the government safe harbour provision in relation to trading whilst insolvent provisions um, is due to end at the end of September. Um, I have not seen that there's any proposed extension for that. So at the moment, the government has basically created a safe harbour provision which says that businesses normally um, are considered insolvent when they can't meet their debts as and when they fall due and there's a strict penalty structure um, against businesses um, trading whilst insolvent. That's been suspended through the pandemic. That finishes in September. So we need to be conscious that businesses need to be solvent and need to have a strong cash perspective or, um, to get them through, otherwise there is that that risk around the legislation concerning trading whilst insolvent. Um, next question um, regarding quarterly eligibility. Will the ATO look at each month in the quarter individually or the quarter as a whole? It's the quarter as a whole. You need to assess your turnover in the June quarter and the September quarter as a whole, not on a month by month basis. Having said that, <coughs> The ATO, again, has broad discretion to allow an exception in particular circumstances. So where you're only off to a minor extent or um, you know, there's an um, unrepresentative experience in a month in a particular quarter, you may want to discuss that with your advisor to see whether you apply for an exemption. But it is on a quarterly basis, not each month. Um, isn't the eligibility period to be taken in February, not March? Um, um, I'm not sure about the eligibility criteria there in question. Um, um, please ask a supplementary question whether you mean effectively the business eligibility or the employee eligibility. Um, um, please ask that if, um, and ask the supplementary question. I'm happy to answer that. Next question, do all three individual months need to be reflected a 30% reduction? Again, just answer that, that it's um, a grouped assessment of the quarter, not the individual months within the quarter. Um, um, is the turnover test assessed as a 15% reduction for charities and not for profits rather than a 30%? Yes, my understanding is that is still the case and extends in. Um, JobKeeper enabled directions. Is the JobKeeper enabling direction process also extended? Good question. Yes, it remains exactly the same. So the legislation around the ability to provide JobKeeper enabled directions, request people utilising their annual leave, request people to alter their place of work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, remains unchanged. Yeah? The only things that have changed so far, and remember that this is an announcement concerning a position in September, and there will be obviously further information which comes down the pipe before then, but the only changes announced is the duration of the scheme. So it's extended to six months. The second um, amendment is employer eligibility, needing to meet an actual turnover test um, for each of the two successive periods. And thirdly, creating two categories of employee eligibility. Um, that is the full-time eligibility and the, the reduced hours eligibility. Um, but the ability to provide or issue JobKeeper enabled directions through that period continue. Having said that, obviously you need to be a JobKeeper 
approved business to be able to do so. So that means is if you don't meet the turnover test and you're not eligible for JobKeeper 2.0, then your ability to issue JobKeeper enabled directions to your employees is removed. Um, lots of questions on um, JobKeeper, which is, which is good, um, and obviously um, and people are very keen around that particular announcement, which is fantastic. So, next question is: If employees' positions are required to be made redundant, can businesses use JobKeeper payments to pay out any of the entitlements, such as notice, severance, and annual leave? Um, yes and no. Um, Yes, you can, in my view, in terms of notice. Um, um, you can't in relation to severance because severance is an entitlement which arises after termination and the JobKeeper scheme is only um, a subsidy in relation to employment costs. And annual leave, <clears throat> yes, but only where you provide a direction and request an employee take annual leave during the period. Now, in my opinion, your ability to do that <clears throat> is removed or significantly reduced after you provide notice of termination. So <clears throat> many businesses will be looking at, and having been encouraging businesses to do this since, since April, look at your annual leave balance try to encourage or direct your employees to take annual leave so that you're reducing that contingent liability during the JobKeeper scheme in a subsidised environment. Um, and a lot of business have done that and they've done it well, meaning that effectively they've significantly reduced their contingent leave entitlement on their balance sheet. Um, and the other thing that you can do, of course, is where you provide notice of termination it is possible that that is in conjunction with a JobKeeper enabled direction that an employee is not required to work and therefore will just simply receive JobKeeper payments during that period. Um, really suggest um, um, that you get professional advice and support in relation to those three categories. But generally speaking, notice, yes. Severance, no. Um, annual leave, possibly, but depending upon the time. Okay, so just to go to the next question, um, if someone was on parental leave for the four weeks, they would fall into the lower category. Would there be grounds to apply to the ATO Commissioner to increase this if they are now back full time? Yes. Um, um, in short, the answer is yes. There is the ability if the four week period, so the four weeks prior to the 1st of March 2020, is not a truly reflective period of the hours worked by the individual, there is the ability to request an alternative arrangement or exemption with the um, Commissioner of Taxation. And I have to say that my, the, the um, views that and, and information that has been fed back to me by many um, financial advisors is, is that the um, ATO have generally applied a pretty generous application in those types of exemptions, questions and circumstances. So, so yes, you're right. Undertake that assessment as soon as you can um, and then effectively um, consider um, on whether you need to apply for an exemption. Um, the next question is, I understood that the JobKeeper criteria for the full payment was 20 hours per week, not 20 hours per fortnight. Are you able to confirm? Um, I can confirm and if you um, um, bear with me, I will certainly confirm that employee eligibility. Um, If in doubt, 
we go to the particular ATO rule that has come through, and I apologise if there's been any uncertainty. You're correct. I apologise, it's 20 hours or more per week on average in the four weeks prior to the 1st of March 2020, which is effectively the month of February in 2020. So the assessment period is the four weeks prior to the 1st of March, which in effect is the month of February, and the condition is 20 hours or more per week. Thank you for that question and allowing me the opportunity to confirm that. Next question. Um, in relation to JobKeeper um, 2.0, the comparable GST turnover you talk about um, to the ATO is, is 2019 was unusually low. What happens in situations where it was high? We had a downturn in the December quarter 2019 as an example. Do we still get to assess on the BAS even though the company has had a decline and therefore the impact of COVID is not as big as it, as it appears. Um, yes, you can. Again, if there is any basis upon which the 2019 period is not comparable, then there is a suggested process that the ATO has currently recommended, but I won't go into it until such time as it's confirmed because I don't want to create any confusion. Um, but there are a number of um, um, alternative arrangements which the, the government has put in place. So in any circumstances where you think that the period is not comparable, um, I'd be suggesting that you reach out to your advisor and consider making an application for exemption. I'm just see um, again the ATO ruling just to see whether I can share with you some of the, the, the basis upon which they say that the period may not be comparable. information and a media release issued by the ATO um, on the 28th of this month um, suggests that um, circumstances where an alternative test may be applicable is where the entity business commenced after the respective comparable period but not after the 1st of March. So that is you commenced business after you know, the June quarter 2019 but before the 1st of March 2020. The entity acquired or disposed of part of the business after the relevant comparison period. The entity undertook a restructure after the relevant comparison period. Um, the entity's turnover substantially increased um, um, by 50% or more in the 12 months immediately before the applicable turnover, 25% in the six months immediately before, or 12.5% in the three months immediately before. The entity was affected by a drought or other natural disaster. The entity had a large irregular variance in their turnover. Or the entity is a small trader or small partnership where sickness, injury or leave has impacted an employee's ability to work which has equally affected turnover. So hopefully that addresses your question. Um, next question, um, if we have um, a casual staff member only willing to work 20 hours, um, they are also taking days off when they know that they will be paid anyway. Um, can we put them in the 750 fortnight per category? Um, we are employees saying that it is unfair to get the 1500 at the moment when they're still only working 20 hours. Um, you, you need to be very cautious in doing this and I'd specifically suggest that you take advice. There was a decision yesterday of the Fair Work Commission where um, a business um, undertook this unilateral step of limiting or removing an employee from JobKeeper due to their reluctance to take um, or work. Um, and 
the um, Fair Work Commission acknowledged that they did not have the authority to determine or decide it, but also indicated that um, the employer may be risking a general protections application by doing so. Um, so I know that there may be an issue of fairness around employee eligibility, but I think that we need to be very conscious and cautious around why we're excluding people um, and consider the reasons for it because we may be automatically giving rise to either a general protections or discrimination claim. So, so just be conscious of that. Um, have, the next question is, have the employees and approved visas been revisited um, and can they claim them for JobKeeper 2.0? Um, in short, no. Um, the eligibility criteria in relation to employees remain the same. Um, so again, um, referring specifically, if you can indulge me, the um, um, rulings and information provided by the ATO, it says the eligibility rules for employees remain unchanged. Um, so, and then it specifically says the employee must either be A, an employee resident, um, um, or an employee resident um, and the holder of a subclass triple four special category visa. So in answer of your question, you know, the proposed amendment to capture others on a um, student visa or other form of visa that has not been made um, and it, the eligibility criteria for an employee remains unchanged. The question is, how does the JobKeeper employee assessment um, um, apply for, for those employees which commenced work after um, the 1st of March 2020? Um, um, I'm not necessarily sure I understand the question given that it's a gatekeeper eligibility process that an employee, either be a full time, a permanent employee employed as of the 1st of March 2020 or alternatively considered to be a long-term casual on the 1st of March 2020 to be eligible for JobKeeper in the first place. So in that sense, they would have um, had to have commenced by this 1st of March. Um, um, so um, perhaps your question was if they haven't been apply, employed for the full period, in which case I would assume that it would just be the average of whatever period was worked. Um, just quickly, only a couple more minutes. I'm sorry, we've had a lot of questions today on JobKeeper. Um, next question is, um, do you have any advice on what to do with JobKeeper casual staff that are only making themselves available for roster purposes um, for only three hours a week? Um, yeah, this, this is an interesting one um, and something which we've advised quite extensively um, on particular industries, you know, hospitality, retail, fast food, etc. Um, there's nothing wrong with you terminating someone's employment um, because of their availability. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, take aside um, JobKeeper. If you had a casual employee that restricted their availability to only three hours per week, um, would you still employ them or would you take them off the books and no longer provide casual employment? Um, so it's the same you know, circumstance here. Um, just because they're um, trying to play the system and reduce their hours by th to three hours, the bare minimum to get the $1,500 per fortnight, doesn't mean that you have to employ them. JobKeeper and the JobKeeper scheme is an employment um, retention scheme, not an employment guarantee scheme. It does not imply that an employee must be continually employed or prevents their termination. So you know, where an employee has significantly altered their availability which no longer aligns with the needs of their business, um, you can indeed look to conclude their employment. As I said before though, you must be very careful that the employee's reason for being unable to work has nothing to do with care responsibility, sickness, etc. So as an example, casual says that they can't work because um, you know, I'm now looking after a child who cannot attend daycare because of COVID and these are the only hours that I'm available because my 
partner doesn't work those hours and that's the only time I can accommodate, then it would be potentially unlawful um, to, to, to terminate their employment on that basis. But if it's simply a process of the employee trying to do the bare minimum and play the system to ensure that they get 1500 a fortnight without earning it, then there are options available to you. Um, two quick last questions um, before um, we um, conclude there. But um, I've heard of employees on JobKeeper being asked to come back into work to assist to reopen the business. These employees have refused to come to work as it's not their usual role. Do you have any guidance or recommendation for this system? Um, yes, so um, in, in effect the JobKeeper legislation is very clear that an employee can be asked to do any other reasonable duties as long as it's reasonable and safe. Um, that's the first thing. Um, secondly, as long as it's their standard days and hours of work, they can be directed to return to work and perform those hours, as, um, again, as long as it's safe to do so. Um, if an employee refuses, um, I would be providing them with a lawful and reasonable direction in writing upon three days' notice. If the employee refuses to follow that lawful and reasonable direction, there is the ability of the business, yourself, to um, make an application to the Fair Work Commission um, to consider the direction and if it's, been, um, if it's held to be reasonable, then the employee must comply with that lawful and reasonable direction and if they don't, um, effectively, um, it's contrary to the order of a court, but also would give rise to termination. So, so lots that you can do there, um, and, and I guess it's just um, a process of having to have that discussion and your willingness to go through the, um, a, a formal process to that extent. Um, last question before we wrap it up today is that um, in Victoria it's mandatory to wear a single-use mask for disability support workers. Um, we have a casual staff member on JobKeeper who is trying to get her GP to make her exempt due to the anxiety of wearing a mask. Can we state that she is unable to carry out the required duties to keep our disability participants safe um, and terminate her employment? Um, yeah, rather complex question in the context of um, various objections um, groups you know, recently with Bunnings and others. Um, um, the, the public health order is that people are required to wear a mask unless they have a medical exemption certificate. Um, so where there is a medical reason supported by a medical certificate, then effectively there is not the ability to effectively apply any detriment or terminate her employment as a result. If, however, the casual employee does not or is unable to provide a, um, a medical certificate, then it can be considered a lawful and reasonable direction that she wears such a mask during the provision of services. And if she refuses to do so, it could be viewed as a failure to follow a lawful and reasonable direction which may give rise to disciplinary proceedings and in the most extreme circumstances, dismissal. But again, as I've mentioned on a number of occasions, we just really need to be conscious around the basis upon which we take that step. Because if your employee in this example is saying that he or she is experiencing um, or suffers from anxiety, which is a um, psychological disability, a mental disability, um, well then um, it may be viewed as either um, a, a discriminatory act or possibly adverse action in the event that you apply any detriment to the employee because of that. So a very difficult framework to navigate through and it's very difficult to answer that completely in just simply two lines of information. So those type of complex arrangements, I would really strongly encourage you um, to come through um, <clears throat> and um, um, seek specific advice on that. Um, so uh, unfortunately, um, we, we've had you know almost 100 questions. I'm sorry today. I, I have not been able to obviously to get through everyone's questions. Um, I, I do 
sincerely thank you for your time and attendance today. Um, hopefully the grouping of questions um, that we've tried to undertake has addressed people's general topics broadly. Um, if you do require any further assistance, um, by all means, please feel free um, to reach out to um, myself or one of my colleagues through HR Assured as we'd be only too happy to assist. So stay safe, um, best of luck, um, and if we can support further, please let us know and please look out for the invitation to our next business forum in two weeks' time. Thank you.